what we're trying to do is go through the process of uh, generating the drawings. Um, our kind of end goal is something that looks like that. There's going to be three of them. It might be tough for those in the back to see it, but um, there is a static uh, version of the model in the background in the cyan color. And the uh, operation in question, in this case it's an expand, is superimposed in the same spot. And the vectors are on top of it. We've got uh, the modular logic which is basically a lot like your uh, book where it shows the, the two modules, but in this case, they're axonometrics that are at the same um, orientation as the main axonometric that's right here. So whatever this happens to be, you're just gonna match that angle up there. Um, this is uh, plan view and the right front and right elevations of the of the expanded model. So there'll be three of those, one for each operation. So there'll be one for the twist and one for um, the compress as well. And basically, uh, the workflow is going to be modeling this in Rhino, then pulling it into the Illustrator um, template. And in between, you're going to use uh, things like Excel and Grasshopper to get into Rhino. The first, where you're at right now, or hopefully where you'll be at is when you start drawing, it should look something like this, where uh, I've got an Excel sheet and it has a column for my X values, a column for my V values, or a column for my Y values, and a column for my Z values, right? I don't need any headers or anything like that. And the way that this is organized is we're just gonna have one per frame, right? and then one per vector set. So in totality, you're probably gonna have seven total of, of the Excel sheets. And then that's because the nature of the Grasshopper definition that we use is very, it's a very basic one, and that way you don't have to install additional plugins. And it, it's a, and it will just start to read, starting with the first cell, and then move it on. So in this case, this was a set of points pulled for the static version of the model, and this is in my case, I've got 36 nodes, and I've got corresponding values for each of them. So what the provided Rhino template really is, is just a series of levels or uh, layers that just kind of let you know what kind of stuff you need to kind of, there's a lot of moving parts, and as always with our processes, uh, layer manage management is the key thing. One thing, uh, the big separator is basically we've got, um, on the demo, this will just be called models, and we've got models and we've got drawings. And the drawings um, are going to be ready to go out into Illustrator. So the first thing you want to do is you want to model all the geometry. So in our case, we're, the first step would be to model uh, the static frame and then the three other frames. And when we model the three other frames, we can also add the vectors in space as well. So we just kind of model them all at the same time. And the typical workflow for that is when I go back to my Excel sheet, right now it, you've got it in any kind of typical Excel installation, it's going to save as, a, as a, an Excel sheet. It's a Excel SX extension. We're going to save it as a different thing. We're going to save it as a CSV, which is, means comma separated value. So it's, you guys have ever used Word and then you've looked at something like uh, notebook or rich text and you know how it's like much more basic and there's not like a lot of options and stuff like that that's kind of the analog here comma separated values is like a it's a it's a it doesn't have all the formatting issues and everything else that an excel worksheet has it basically is literally comma separated values so it's it's a wide open format that you can read with different types of programming languages in this case grasshopper and all it does is it has two methods of separation a comma means move over one in the same in the same row. And then if there's an enter somewhere, it means go to the next row. And that's it. It's, so it reads out that way. For us, it's good because it if we've got it stacked, it's going to read one, two, three, and then go off to the next one. Read one, two, three, go off to the next one. So you want to save it as that um, and kind of keep that in mind. It won't work uh, with just an Excel sheet. And I'm going to call mine that. 
or actually this, the demo one, and I'm just gonna remind myself that it's a common separated value sheet. You're gonna get some kinds of prompts that's basically telling you you're ditching formatting, but we don't have any formatting on this, so it's fine, you just accept and say okay. You want this file closed. If you leave this file open, it won't work. You'll get an error in, in Grasshopper. So make sure this, this file is closed. And then I'm going to go back into uh, Rhino. I'm going to start up Grasshopper. So all the computer labs have Grasshopper. You just start it by plugging, uh, start typing it, and it'll autocomplete. You hit enter. If you've got Rhino on Windows on your own machine, it'll you can download it for free if you go to grasshopper3d.com. I don't have really the time here to, to tell you uh, how to use Grasshopper and be some kind of master of it. Um, but I can kind of tell you what you're doing and kind of explain uh, through our workflow what's going on behind the scenes. So Grasshopper's interface looks like this. It's a canvas that houses uh, components and parameters. It's, it's visually scripting from left to right, so the data flows for us is going to go left to right. Um, there's going to be a zip file that has two Grasshopper definitions. The first Grasshopper definition reads the Excel sheet and generates points, and that's the one that we're going to open up. So there'll be a folder called Support Files and a, and a file called Points from CSV. So I open that up, and it looks like this. It's really simple. This parameter stores the file path for our CSV file. This one reads it and outputs numbers and this is just a little text panel here that's showing you what's coming out of it and this converts it to points and it sits on the side of Rhino so nothing's going off on our, on our model space now because nothing's going on. I've got an error here because it's not getting any data at all or right now it's getting bad data. So when I open this up what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click this parameter and say set one file path. And what it's asking now is where's the CSV file that you want to read off of. So wherever you've kept your file is where you're going to go. I've got mine here in a folder called Excel and I'm going to go to the demo CSV file and hit open. You can see that this panel then updates. So it's this component here is reading the contents of the file and it's outputting XYZ values. So Every row is now a row in here, and then this component is creating points in here. Doesn't matter. Um, this is just a model space, right? It's just gonna be hanging out in the model, and these are just X's right now. I've got some other geometry in there. Shouldn't be there. Don't worry about it. Let me turn it off. <clears throat> So right now it's just preview geometry. It's not in Rhino. If I closed out Grasshopper completely, it would go away. If I select that, it turns green because that's what selected geometry does. In order for it to turn into Rhino geometry, I've got to bake it. So I'm going to right click this that has the points in there and hit bake. And it's going to ask me where it wants to go in terms of where do the points go. And I'm going to go and I've got a, underneath my models here, I've got static model, and I've got points for my static model, right there. I'm going to say bake it on that level. I'm going to hit OK. You can see that once I close this out, and if I take Grasshopper, and I even make that not visible for a second. These are actual Rhino points now that are in my model from, from this CSV. Uh, taking a look at the grid, you can see that they're just going to show up um, wherever. So in terms of where my origin is, it's all your, you could, if you can imagine your origin point, maybe your origin point was um, right here and that's where you start to measure. It's all relative to that. It really doesn't matter where it shows up. It just matters that you kept the same origin point every time you did your measurements, right? So from here, what you're going to do is just re based really kind of simply just reconfigure or remake your actual um, on the on the on the layer up underneath it. You're just going to make and you can just use the line command to do that. And I want to take my grid 
and turn it off in a second. So what I want to do when I'm drawing my, 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 my frame here is I want to turn on the point snap so it'll snap the points. End snaps and all these other snaps won't work because these are point objects and that's the only snap that works for it. And you can really simply, it won't take that much time, you've only got so many pieces there, is to, is to kind of redraw it from that. So then you've got the basic structure of the, the frame mapped out, depending on your actual setup there. Right? So let's, I'm going to do my Martha Stewart thing, and I'm just going to show you what that looks like already done for this one, so you don't have to watch me draw a million lines um, and pull it out all said and done. It looks like that when I when I when I keep when I keep drawing it right. So I'm going to these objects. So I don't want to have duplicate objects. And I'm going to take these. And make myself a copy. So I've got I've got my model now. Just make sure I'm not skipping anything. So you're basically going to do this for all four, right? It's just going to be a matter of taking those, bringing them in, and drawing them. And the, the only difference is you're loading up um, different ones each time. So just to show you what the expanded one would look like. I've got the expanded curves in there as well, so I'm going to turn my static one off. And my expanded frame is right there with the curves drawn in. I've got some old points in there. So, I'll take those out. Yeah. so that's the expanded one, right? Draw them the same way. And what I would also have on, on the um, expanded one would be the vector curves. So I would bring those in as a set of points, same way on a, a, on a, on a CSV. Bring them in and draw them. I, I've got them in red here, just so you can see the difference between them. It doesn't, the colors right now don't matter. But the important thing is like the structure of the model after the static one, you can see the compress and twist all have layers for your vector curves. So then you'll have those in there as well. And you're just kind of swapping in and out. So you can draw all four of these and then Basically, once you've drawn all four of them, you've got all the geometry that you need for the rest of the thing. From there, it's just getting the right projection and then getting it out and format it to go into Illustrator. So the geometry that you want to do is we're going to pipe it. These lines right now are good if you take a look at the drawing. They're already good for a good chunk of the drawings. They're good for these, the modular logic, the plan, and the front and right elevations. Uh, but we want the piping for the exonometrics because they're larger. So what I'm going to do is also, but when I just to kind of go back for a second on this on the static one, is I'm going to make a copy of my modules. Once I draw it, I'm just going to make a copy of the modules. So you can just basically pick. In, my, in this case, I just went and grabbed right two that were face to face and brought them out. And you might have a missing member like here that's redundant, and you just redraw them so that you've got them sitting there. Pull them off to the side, kind of treat them as their own as their own thing, right? So, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe it, and basically, on the pipe, I'm going to do a one sixteenth. Sorry, that's my exonometric geometry, and we're going to use the one sixteenth every time. And I don't have to worry about piping the modules. If I pick them all at first, it won't even ask me if I want to multiple, mul do multiple pipe. It'll just it'll just assume that I want to do the multiple pipe for everything. And I'm just going to have no changes here. I'm going to do no, keep it flat, no fit to rail. I'm going to say my pipe radius is going to be 1 16th. The model's already in inches, so you don't have to worry about the units. All right. And that should be on the pipes layer. So now that's piped. Um, and the next thing I want to do is just I can run down and pipe the other three as well while I'm at it. So I would open up the expand and pipe that. 
one sixteenth, same deal. Looks like if I got a missing one there, so I'm gonna put that guy at one sixteenth. And so on and so forth. Don't worry about piping any of the vectors or anything like that. Um, and then you can, and then basically you can move on for the axonometric projection. So when you talk about the axonometric projection, there's a, I've got these little layers here called that for that specific, for that specific case. What you end, what you end up with is something that looks like tilted backwards. And the reason that is, is because the axonometric, uh, axonometric projection isn't something that we can naturally establish in Rhino, right? We, we've got we've to distort it to show it. If we want to do an isometric, it's built in. But with the axonometric, we've actually got to make it happen. And what we do is we make it happen from the top view. So it's distorted right now. But if I look at it from the top view, it's not distorted. And that's what I want. So in order to achieve that, this one, and I'll bring back uh, my my model, Go to static. The typical way that you would do it, and you can and you can do it simultaneously. Um, for this one if you wanted to, but it's easier to do it on its own, is to select the object, decide on what angle that you want to rotate it at to show it at. So in this case, when we look back at our example, this is at a 60 degree rotation to my, to the right, to the right side. Um, you're not going to necessarily do 60, maybe it works for you, maybe it's not. You, it would require some trial and error, and it would basically require you to rotate it. So let's say I rotate it in this case, 45 degrees in that direction. I would rotate it to the, the point that I like, and then I would go into the right view, and I would skew it, so I'd transform it. Is it skew or is it shear? It's the shear ones, and I would say I want to pick the corner point, so I'm going to use my end snap and the end point, and I'm going to bend it back that way. So my shear angle, in this case, I would say is negative 45. It's always negative 45. It's always away from the camera. So then when I look back up on the top view, the axonometric is set up, and that's the view that I would export out from it, right? So that would be some, 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 some kind of trial and error to figure out what view looks particularly good for you. Because once it's this way, it's kind of a one-way street. Like if I rotate it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't make any sense to do it that way. Um, so the, in, in order to kind of anticipate that and for you to test it out, I wrote a, a, a grasshopper definition that actually lets you do it a little bit easier and to preview multiple angles. So that's the other grasshopper definition that's in there. And that is the axon preview. Definition. So this de this definition. It should be okay. Let's see. If not, I can update it. I want to set the geometry for it. So I want to. This is the geometry that I set up for it. It can accept any kind of geometry. I'm going to set multiple geometries, and for the. Uh, Pipes layer, I'm going to select the objects on that pipes layer and say I want to draw an axon metric of just my pipes. You don't have to worry about the curves. And I hit enter. And it gives me a preview of the axonometric in the viewport. It's in red because it's it's grasshopper and it's just previewing it. But now I can decide on what rotation degrees that I actually want to use. So I can start to use the slider to figure out what one I particularly want to use. You can test it out. Since everyone's geometry is going to be different, there's going to be different values for everybody. And you can basically decide. So this is going to be the projection for like all three drawings. So let's say I fool around with that. I decide, well, you know, I'm going to stay with 60. I want to keep it at 60. Um, 
there's your three inputs. So when you want to basically do your other axonometrics, you just do it the same way. You just bring it in here, send it in there, and you can include the vectors as well. This little thing here just lets you change the, the location in case your stuff's getting in the way. You can move it over and just kind of move it out of the way in case it's like colliding or, or getting on top of like your geometry or something like that. So if you want it like that, you can just grab it and move it away. That's just moving it. It's not changing the geometry at all. Okay, same deal. I would right click it and bake it. And in this case, I'm gonna bake it to the, I'm on static, I'm baking it to the axon because it's just an axon metric geometry. And I say, okay, it's gonna basically take those pipes and now I've got a new set of pipes here on the grasshopper. I'm just turning the preview off so you can see that it's regular line of geometry. Yeah, regular stuff. So from that point, you're gonna basically do that for the other three. Now you've got the angle set, you don't have to worry about it anymore. All you have to do is once you have your pipe geometry, just right click it and say set multiple geometries, right? And like in this case, I want to, if I turn on my expand layer and I right click on the uh, pipes and say select objects over here. It's going to use that same angle for the rotation that's going to happen. And I can just keep running that along all the way. Bake it. Keep going. So once I've got all the geometry set up, I've got my axonometric geometry. Um, I'm going to do the same thing for my modules as well. I'm not going to leave those behind. Turn my preview back on for it. And you can see that's showing up as well. Bake that. I've got a layer for that just called module curves axon. So once you make your copy of your curve module, you can just bake it to that axonometric layer. So that's on there as well. I can bake that one on there. So now I've got all the geometry that I need. Once that I do that for my other uh, three translations, I can start to actually work on the drawings themselves. Um, the drawings themselves aren't that complicated. They're, it's just um, the, the big thing that we want to talk about on that one is the, that you want to make sure that you're aligning the drawings correctly. And in order to do that, um, it, it can be a little tough because once you start to distort your frames enough, you won't have any kind of common points anymore. So you don't want to rely on that. What you want to do is you want to register it with something that's kind of unbiased and arbitrary along the whole way. And in order to do that, there's a, there's a toolbar that they included called ViewMaker. Um, it's something that we use because typically um, if you use the make 2D command, so if I say I want to draw, I'm going to pick my axonometric uh, frame I'm going to select those objects and I say I want to do a make 2D right now of it. There's an option here that's called show viewport rectangle, but it, it's not enabled. I can't use it. It's something that only works in perspective. So if I was in perspective and I run that command again, it's, a, it's available to me, but it's blocked in any kind of parallel projection. So we talk about planes. I don't know why. It's not nice, but we just we do a workaround and we basically just want a script that does it for us anyway. 
what I've got here is if, if I say it's like this is a good view, right? I, I can see pretty much everything, and I also anticipate that maybe I'll be stretching out later. Maybe I'll need a little bit more space for my expand or something like that. So if I say I like this view, the document already has for you some named views. This is basically all the named views that help you set up to get all your geometry out, right? In case you mess up and move the camera, there's also these viewports already set up. There's basically your top and your perspective, and there's also front, right, axon, and plan exports. They're just there so you can kind of know what drawings are coming out and then line them up consistently. So let's say yours is probably going to be different than where mine is. I'm just going to pick it and hit the save, and it'll ask me what the name is. I'm just going to keep it the same. It'll ask me, do I want to overwrite it? And I say yes. So now I've updated that save view so that if I move my camera by mistake in this named views panel, I just double click it and it comes back and I don't have to worry about it anymore, right? So now that I have that, I'm gonna do, instead of typing in make 2D, I'm gonna use the view maker button, which is just this, this button right here. That's a plugin, it's not even a plugin, it's just a toolbar. And that's also gonna be in the, in the folder, the supports files. That's just a uh, ViewMaker right here. It's an RUI file. That's just a toolbar file. You just drag it right into Rhino. And it'll pop up. And if you don't see it, right, you just go to your tools under your toolbar layout. And you, and you look at ViewMaker and you, make and you say check it <coughs> and check it to make sure it's there. And it'll pop up. So you can see it just popped up. For some reason, the image starts disappearing. The button's there, though. Don't know why it's been doing that today. So typically, I just go in and put some kind of image there, just to let remind myself that there's an actual button there, right? So the ViewMaker runs this script. It's going to ask you if I run it right now. It's just going to ask me to pick the geometry first. That's what it's saying up there. So I pick it first, and then I run it. And you guys probably can't see it, but there's a little yellow line there. What it actually did was it created a 3D curve. What, is, what, the, what the script's going to do, it's going to create a 3D curve around our camera viewport. Make a 2D of that, and then delete it later, but leave us with the 2D version of it. Um, so for this one, I'm going to say, okay, I don't need the hidden lines. It's going to draw it. And it's going to drop it off the node. And what it, it dropped off is my drawing and then this viewport frame. So the important thing with this is now, don't change the size of your viewport. Don't change where this toolbar thing is and don't change any of this stuff because it'll make it a little bit more confusing when you're lining it up. So now I'm locked in because when I go to my, uh, when I go to my, uh, do my other drawings, I've got a save view that I can use and I just go into my layers and I just change where stuff is. So in this case, because I did another example, it's in a different spot. But for yours, it won't be because your frames are all in the same spot. And that way your axons are all going to be rotated in the same spot. So it'll be there and you can, you can line it back up. So when you do the axon, you just want to do the, the vectors as well. And you're going to use the same angle for, for, for all cases. So you don't really have to worry too much about how your nodes align because you'll be able to align the frames. And that's the thing that's important. So that's the big thing. Just don't change the viewport size. Um, so what I did and, and to kind of to, to set it up is when I take these drawings, they're not quite ready out. The, the things with the single curvature, like your modules, will be ready to go. Your elevations and your plans should be clean. But because this has depth, there's going to be kind of collisions and things like that. And you're going to see some noise on it. Um, basically, what I did with that is I just made another layer called Clean Drawings. And underneath that, there's sub layers for all the drawings you need to get out. There's one for both elevations. There's one for the axonometric. 
and there's one for the plant. And what we're looking to have is something that looks a little bit cleaner than that. So if I look at my static one, I want a cleaned up version of it. Let's show what that looks like. The clean version of it doesn't have any of those, the noise on it, and every kind of connection is kind of cleaned up. So some of that stuff is, is just a little bit of work. It's not too bad. Basically what you want to use, there's a couple commands that you can do. It's join, blend curve, trim, fillet, extend, and split. And I'll show you what I mean by that. We've used, a, I think we used the blend curve uh, last time around. This is how this is how the uh, how the drawing came out. So in this case, I've got a kind of a mess here. I've got different intersections at the same time. So this in this case, I would use the blend curve. Command. This one and this one, and it's going to give us that preview window. I'm going to say okay. And with that one done, I can start to clean up the extra stuff and get it in there. So that works on the rounded edges. You can also use things like trim. So in this case, it would work as well. But you're going to see lots of different kinds of situations and things that happen when you start to zoom in. And what I typically would do is under, under my, uh, my clean drawings here, I've got an annotation dot layer and I just, when I, cause there's so many of these, it's, it's, it's easy to lose track. I just make a dot and I just say, you know, say, okay on it. And I just drop it in there and say, that one's good. That one's good. And I just work my way down and see what's going on. So in this case, you've got a gap. So that's when you could do a fillet. And you can set the radius to be zero. If you set the radius to be zero, it's gonna be a sharp corner. And I can just fill it there too. So I can start to, you can, it'll tell you what it used to be. In this case, I don't really just need this stuff at all. So I'm just gonna delete it. All right, that's okay. So it's gonna take some kind of maintenance and some drawing on, on your part to make this stuff clean, but it's, it's not too bad. The extend comes in if I, I don't know if I got a case of that, but you'll see it when there's just like, well, there's a, there's a case where I would trim it, right? That's my cutting object and I trim it. I've got two there. Sometimes you'll have overlapping curves. So you can, you can type in SEL DUP for the select duplicates and get rid of any kind of extra double curves that you've got. So that's the workflow for cleaning it up. It's just a matter of using those couple of commands. To do it. Um, I'm trying to see if there's an extend one. On some of these, you can just use join. So it, I, I, it's going to be your call whether or not you start to show these elbows and things. You want to kind of keep it as clean as you can, um, but you just want to be consistent. So if I show it on this one, I want to show it on the one above it. You just don't want to mix it up. You just want to be consistent with it. If you're looking to close it up and say, well, I'm going to leave this elbow here, but I don't like these. If you do join, it'll it'll cover gaps up if you don't pick them at the same time, but you pick them in a row, it'll just add that value into it. Just after you're done, hit enter and no join in that um, So yeah, so that's the workflow for that. Kind of just get work your way down there. And eventually you're gonna have something that's that's ready to go. And you can just do it for all of them. Once, once I got them done, what I did was I took, because everything is going to come in in the make 2D layer, obviously. I took that stuff and I put it on this layer called clean drawings. Under clean drawings, I just have 
my current working. So I've got expand and static, which are right here. And for each one, it, where it says frame and boundary, I've got the frames. And I've got the boundaries that are going on with it. So that way, when I come into Illustrator, I'm just going to have layers called three things. Frames, vectors, boundaries. And I know exactly what I'm talking about. I moved my viewport when I did the demo version of it. But the thing about it was I didn't change this diameter. I, I only changed this direction. So when mine aligned by just aligning these two corners right up to each other, they align fine. But in, in, in a perfect world, they'd both be like that size because they're aligned by that distance. So even now I could come and just fix that if I wanted to because they should be the same size. Yours are going to look more like that because you're smarter than me and you're not going to move your stuff by mistake. Right? These are kind of self-explanatory. You've got front export and right export that are that are coming out, and all you need to worry about when you do when you do those uh, views is going to be making sure that you only do the curves. The curves are the only things you have to worry about. So when I go back to my static model, for example, I can turn off the other geometry. I don't have to worry about the axonometric stuff or anything like that. And these views are going to be set up for you already too, but like I said, you might have to move them. They're in the saved views. So like for instance, the front export is just going to have all your curves and stuff like that. So if I take off the pipes, you might have to zoom in and out and reset it or something like that. To set it up. So once I have my curves in there, that's my module. Let's say that's a good one, right? So I just go to my save view and say the front. I'm going to rename it. Make 2D. Um, I would use the view maker for this one as well. And I did when you look at my at my copy. That's all I did. So my output is going to have all this stuff. So once you've got this and then you've got the other two, you're ready to move on to exporting it. Once you've got your kind of drawings cleaned up, you're ready to kind of go off and export your final drawings. You can you can do this all as one file if you want, if it's all set up and you can and you can drop things in. So maybe you could do it that way too, since I've got everything here. I can just use that. So um, the only time that you wouldn't want to do something like this is if you had an idea of how big these are and how big you want to make them. Um, but it's kind of going to be scaling to your to your kind of thing. So they're all going to need scaling either way. There's no real way around it to get like the perfect size. I think you can give it a shot. I think I came at when I when I started to do it. It was like a for the axonometrics. It was like one point two five to one, and the other ones were like a five to one scale when I when I did them separately. Um, but just for the case of for speed to to not do it a bunch of times, I'll export them all at the same time. Just make sure you're doing now the top viewport. Um, I'm just going to do a snapshot of the current view because I know they need to re be rescaled. I'm going to say CMYK, even though I'm going to change the colors anyway, that's not going to matter. So when I go back in here, um, one thing to kind of point out is We've got uh, swatches here. This is a custom swatch that'll be in there. That's for the drawing. And those are the three colors that we, we're gonna use for the drawing. It's uh, the cyan, there's true black, and there's magenta that's in there. It'll be part of the template, but if it's missing, you can always go and get custom swatches by going to this little menu here and saying, open swatch library, other library, and you can browse to it. And in that folder, 
support files. There's there's the swatches. There's the same thing, swatches for an array. So you can see they're floating there, right? But I've already got them here, so it's kind of I don't need them. I'm gonna go and open up. Let's see. No, I'm not gonna find that where I left that file. For close project two drawings, demo two drawings. Hmm. Okay, got it. <laughs> Stuff's in there. This is a matter of kind of just layer management. But if I if I take a look at it, it's kind of telling me where everything kind of came from. I can take this kind of stuff and drop it in the one of these names are kind of long. I would typically take it down and edit it down a little bit, so it's 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 not that long. In this case, it's a matter of you would just take it and you can get rid of all this stuff so that you're not looking because this is giving you everything that you need to know. There's already spots in here with, for the Illustrator stuff. So my static one is the first one I'm going to take. I'm going to take it. I'm going to do a control C, copy it, and take it in here. I've got layers uh, for drawings here, and I always do that double check to make sure that the paste remember layers option is clicked on there. That's good. Uh, that just keeps my stuff named, and it doesn't come off really sloppy. There's a kind of note here for the drawing conventions. And I'm going to paste it in there. It's going to come in at whatever size it came in. And I'm just going to start to scale it to get an idea of how I want it to scale. You're kind of keeping in mind that I'm going to have like ones like expand and twist in there. And that I'm going to have vectors flying off this thing as well. So I don't want to max it out. I don't want to like take it to the, the mega limits. I want to give myself a little bit of negative space in there. If I look at my layers, this is the stuff that I just dropped in. So I'm going to take that static stuff and into my drawings. I'm going to go down to static and drop it in static axon. I've got my boundary and I've got my frame, the actual drawing itself. I can wait till later, uh, but since um, this is the only time, this is the only color, the thing that's this color, I'm going to do a stroke. This one's at 0.5. And the color on it is going to be blue. Once I'm happy with it, once I once I think okay, this is good, I'm going to use this. Um, I'm going to take I'm going to take these drawings and I'm going to make two copies of them for my other two boards. So I'm going to pick this stuff, and in Illustrator, especially more even so the CAD, you you don't want to trust your eyes if you don't, unless you have to because um, it's not as exact as a CAD modeler and sometimes things just don't line up correctly. So if you get a chance to, and you know that this is right, the way that these boards are set up is they're 24 inches tall and they're stacked on each other. There's no gaps. So I would just use the object um, transform and use the move. And I'm gonna move it vertically 24 inches and I'm gonna hit the copy. It's not negative because graphics programs and 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 uh, web stuff starts from the top left corner, and the Y positive goes down. It's opposite of uh, Cartesian coordinates. But I didn't hit copy. I hit OK. So I do object transform move, and I'll do OK. 
you'll copy that and I'll just take that existing one and then just do it again. So it'll remember transform again. We'll do the, the, the previous transform you did. And it's also the, the keyboard shortcut. I think that's what Philip was saying. I think there's control D, is that what you were saying? Yeah, so that's the keyboard shortcut to do the last thing. So now I've got three. I know in my drawing, they're always gonna be in the same place. Those are done. Then, because I've got these frames, I can go back and bring in this one. Let's say that this is my expand. So I'm gonna paste that in there. I've got everything selected and I'm holding down shift and I'm using my smart guides to align my geometry up. And if you're not sure, you can always hit control Y and then I'll turn it into wireframe mode to make sure that things are lined up. I've got this is my expand axonometric, so I go down to here and drop it in that layer. And this is my frame. So this one's going to be at a 0.75, and I'm going to change the color to be true black. It's going to look different than this black. So don't leave it on the black that it comes into. True black has different values. This document should be... I'll change that, <clears throat> but, come, but the, the, the colors will be the same because the swatch was saved at the right value, so it'll be okay either way. That's on there. I've also got, what else came on there? The vectors came on there, right? So the vectors might be the trickier part of the drawing. I'm going to drop that in there and my vectors in there. This is why you want to do yours, and this isn't this isn't an example of it, but you want when you do your make 2D, you want to do it with the vectors in case you've got vectors that are going like through your model. It'll just go through and underneath it. You don't want to just drop them on there and make it and mess with the depth of the drawing by just like things, oh, I pulled in the way back, but it's in the front of my drawing. So if you if you do the make 2D at the same time as the vectors, you're going to start tucking away and hiding some of the vectors, which is good. And you, you just won't see them. It'll start to occlude them, and that's a good thing. So if I had a vector that was pulling on this point here, it would go behind this, behind this, behind that, and then come out the other, the other side. It'll be broken up in your case, and that's cool. So like, there's a general rule that when I look at my vectors um, right here, we're saying that we want to use, um, for swatches, we want to use the magenta. And then for the stroke, we want to add arrowheads and believe it was number 21 on the start. Not that big, right? Because my weight's up there. This is only one. And I'm also going to do number 11 for the end. That makes it a little bit smaller than what we want. So we're going to bump up the scaling on the, on the end to be 200%. So you do like the broad rule first, you apply it to the, your entire layer to see what you've got. And then you, you adjust it from there, right? Um, you might require a little adjustment because it, things get chopped off or something like that. So I might have to go and adjust my point to be back on there, but I can visually stay on, on target and do that kind of stuff, right? Um, in this case though, for this particular guy, if I'm saying that, let me let me kind of drag him back so you can see where the circle would be. I don't, that's actually in front where it needs to be behind. So I would go to this individual, and since I'm only picking one at a time now, it's just going to deal with him, and I would take off that beginning and say none. Right? I don't want that on there. And I would actually, mine would already be cropped, so I didn't need to drag it down there. That was just for show so so it would still be there and i can just grab it and say no arrow it so the stuff that i wouldn't see would start to get blocked up there the ones that are up front might need a little attention just graphically extending it out But it's repeat and rinse for that once you get done um that you've got you've got the uh the static 
the boundary, the frames, you can turn those off and you can turn all your other actual frames off. So I go to my expand and turn that actual boundary off. These are much simpler. I would say just with these, you want to, you kind of want to align the sizes and keep them consistent. So whatever you, whatever, you, whenever you're scaling these, you want to kind of treat them as one thing. And that way, if you do it that way, you'll be able to align your plan up with your other drawings. So I've got my plan. And I'm going to lock my labels and stuff like that. So I can adjust it. The, the, these two drawings, the elevations, are going to hang out in the same window. Right now they're a little too big. My plan's a little too big. Again, pretty close. And since I haven't changed, I just get them all at the same time. My plan and my um, stuff are all going to line up. So if I start to take off some of these boundaries here. You can start to see that. So this guy, this guy, this guy. They're going to be down to 0.75 as well. Oh, I left my module guy behind. No one told me. What happened, man? I left, I left him behind. The module guy is going to be the same deal, though. I, it's just going to bring him in, and you're going to scale into size. I would scale actually the module the same time that I scale the frame, and that way it's the same size as your as your static frame when you bring them in. So you can just bring the module in at the same time, and just like I scaled these three drawings at the same time, you can scale that one at the same time, and you can see him. He's the same one. So the black only has one stroke. It's like point. It's point seven five. The module is going to be the same as all the other ones. Um, yeah, that's it. Let me pause.